Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to be talking about the February 1974 election, the first of two elections that happened in 1974, and an election that was called 16 months earlier than it needed to be at a moment of crisis for the Heath government. With inflation soaring, living standards in decline, and the National Union of Mine Workers threatening strike action, the Heath government declared a state of emergency and imposed a three-day week on industry eventually calling an early election in February 1974 in the midst of crisis and industrial disharmony to ask the country, who governs Britain? Is it the government or is it the unions? The result in the end was totally indecisive. Harold Wilson's Labour Party gained 14 seats, the Conservative Party lost 28 seats and no party won an overall majority in the House of Commons producing the first hung parliament in the UK since 1929. This led Edward Heath to remain in office immediately after the election as the government entered into coalition talks with the Liberal Party to see if it would prove possible to form a coalition government. But unlike in 2010, where the outcome was a coalition between the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats, in this case the talks failed because the Conservative Party did not offer the Liberals enough on electoral reform. This led to the resignation of Heath and brought a Labour-led minority government into office led by Harold Wilson, which lasted just seven months, with a second election in October of the same year finally producing a Labour majority of just three seats. The fact that there were two elections in one year in 1974 is very unusual and added to the sense of crisis and instability. In fact, the holding of two elections in a single year has only happened once before in 1910, and it hasn't happened since. In the February 1974 election, there was a surge in support for smaller parties, leading many to question whether the era of two-party politics was over. For example, the Liberal Party, led by Jeremy Thorpe, increased their vote share by 11.8 percentage points compared to 1970, but only picked up 14 seats, despite the fact that they won 6 million votes or 19.3% of the vote overall, an example of how First Past the Post punishes minor parties whose support is spread out across the country. The SNP also did well in this election, doubling their vote share in Scotland and increasing their seats from 1 to 7, something of a breakthrough for a party that had only won their first MP in the 1970 election. The election also resulted in Northern Ireland establishing itself as electorally different from the rest of the UK, in that it elected no MPs from the established Westminster parties in this election. This was a product of the Ulster Unionists withdrawing support from the Conservative Party in response to the proposals contained in the Sunningdale Agreement. These proposals infuriated the Unionists because they felt that they would give the Republic of Ireland too much influence in the North, which meant that they refused the Conservative whip after the election, helping to put Harold Wilson in number 10 with the most support in Parliament. This election was also unusual due to being held in winter and due to the very short election campaign, with only 20 days between the dissolution of Parliament on the 8th of February and polling day on the 28th of February. Edward Heath was no doubt hoping to use the short campaign to focus on the key question he asked the electorate in the context of industrial unrest. Who governs Britain? But unlike in 2019, where the single issue of Brexit dominated, Heath's gamble of calling an early election centred around a single theme failed and he lost the majority he had unexpectedly won in 1970. The backdrop to this election was a crisis caused ultimately by high inflationary pressure and the failure of the Heath government's prices and incomes policy to keep a lid on wage demands from the unions, with the National Union of Mine Workers' successful ballot for strike action being the pretext Heath used to call the election. Heath had already been forced to declare a state of emergency at this point due to a reduction in coal stocks caused by an overtime ban by the NUM implemented in November 1973 which therefore threatened the electricity supply from coal-fired electricity plants. In this period, commercial electricity consumption was limited to three days for all businesses, football matches were banned in the evenings and television and pubs ceased to operate after 10.30pm. The Conservative Party's argument going into the election was that the government needed a mandate to deal with the crisis, 
but one might have thought that an election in the midst of a confrontation with the unions was not wise, especially since the passage of the Industrial Relations Act in 1971 had damaged the Heath government's relationship with the union movement, and voters might therefore conclude that a Labour government might stand a better chance of persuading the unions to limit their pay demands. Instead, Heath made the decision to call an election 16 months earlier than he needed to in the winter during a period of crisis, and the result would prove this to have been an unwise move. During the campaign, the miners' strike started, although it was a much more sedate strike than was the case two years prior. This led Jim Pryor to remark that the miners had been as quiet and well-behaved as mice. This made it much harder for Heath to frame the election as a confrontation between the government and the unions, especially as the Director General of the CBI was reported to have said that the passage of the Heath government's Industrial Relations Act in 1971 had sullied every relationship between employers and the unions at a national level. The Pay Board also released a report during the campaign that undermined the government's position in pointing out that the coal board were paying the miners less than the average industrial worker. And to make matters worse, it was revealed during the campaign that the balance of trade was at its worst level on record and RPI inflation had hit 20%, further damaging the government's economic credibility. Another prominent issue during the campaign was Britain's recent entry into the European Economic Community, the precursor to the European Union. Labour's policy was to renegotiate Britain's terms of membership and hold a referendum on the issue, whereas the Conservative Party were committed to Britain remaining in. This led Maverick MP Enoch Powell, who refused to stand as a Conservative candidate in the election, to argue that voters should vote Labour in the election on the grounds that EEC membership was a threat to British sovereignty, which prompted the Sun newspaper to lead with the headline, Enoch puts the boot in. The Conservative Party ran a very negative campaign in this election, highlighting the economic risk of electing a Labour government, with one campaign ad arguing that Labour would not have to move much further to the left before you could find yourself not even owning your own home. Whilst the Conservatives argued that Labour were in the pockets of the trade unions, the Labour campaign emphasised their strong relationship with the trade unions placed them in a better position to negotiate a compromise. Both election manifestos were criticised for lacking detail in this election. The Labour manifesto, for example, was only 10 pages long, but it was a radical document, heavily influenced by figures on the left of the party such as Tony Benn. The document committed the party to a fundamental and irreversible shift in the balance of power and wealth in favour of working people and their families, which prompted the Conservative Party to argue that a Labour victory would be a national disaster. The Liberals, under the charismatic leadership of Jeremy Thorpe, came into the election having won five seats from the Conservative Party in by-elections in 1972 and 1973. Their vote share was to increase markedly in the election, but this was despite the fact that their charismatic leader, Jeremy Thorpe, spent much of his time in his North Devon constituency, so he was forced to attend press conferences in London via video link. Meanwhile, the SNP campaign focused on the discovery of North Sea oil with the slogan, It's Scotland's Oil, highlighting a potential benefit of an independent Scotland. The print media were incredibly hostile to Labour in this election, with the Evening Standard describing the Labour MP Tony Benn as the most dangerous man in Britain, and the Telegraph warning that a Labour victory would lead to complete ruin, public and private. Only the Daily Mirror backed Labour at this election, with even The Guardian remaining ambivalent. Despite the enthusiastic support for the Conservative Party in the media, the gamble of an early election didn't pay off for Edward Heath. Although the Conservative Party won more votes than Labour, Labour ended up with more seats, and the result was the first Hong Parliament since 1929 and a minority Labour government led by Harold Wilson, which limped on for seven months before a second election had to be called. Looking back at the election, it's not difficult to understand why Heath failed to secure a majority. The government went into the election campaign behind in the polls in the midst of an economic crisis, and Heath's framing of the election as a vital opportunity for voters to decide who governs Britain failed to reflect voters' underlying concerns. The Conservatives' election manifesto lacked detail, 
and their attacks on Labour, whilst amplified by the right-wing press, failed to strike enough of a chord with voters when the country already seemed to be in a mess, with economic figures released during the campaign demonstrating the government's failure and incompetence. In fact, it's hard to imagine how Heath could have picked a worse time for an election, a clear failure of political judgment from a politician who also lacked the popular touch of the far more personable Wilson. In the end, Britain would fail to elect a government with a decisive majority until Thatcher came to power in 1979 with a mandate and with the political will to implement the bold and radical economic policies we now call Thatcherism. I hope you've enjoyed this video, which is part of a series of videos I've produced on UK general elections. If you do like this video, please consider sharing it with others. And of course, you can like and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more of my content. For now, goodbye and best wishes. Thank you.